Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time I tangled with a mad Scotchman, a phony English lord and a beautiful blonde corpse in a freight house, all because of a butler who walked on his knuckles. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Monkey's Uncle. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who are you? Who's Cornelius? Where are you calling from and about what? Let's have it a slow step at a time, huh? Aye. My name's Wesley Macduff, Mr. Marlowe. All right, lead on, Macduff. I'm calling from a telephone booth opposite the Bigman Plaza Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard where... Hmm? Ashley Duke. Ashley who? Going for the Bigman Plaza. Lord Ashley Duke himself across the street. Now, wait a minute. I've got to get to him. Mr. Marlowe, hurry. Meet me in the hotel lobby. Yes, but... Quickman, we've got to stop them. They're going to kill Cornelius. first reaction was to forget the whole thing. Curiosity is strong stuff with me. Any triumvirate labeled Wesley McDuff, Lord Ashley, Duke, and Cornelius had to add up the screwball no matter where you started. But the word kill was still big in my vocabulary, so I buttoned the office up quickly, got down in my car, and drove over to the Beekman Plaza Hotel, where a ten-minute stand in the lobby produced nothing closer to worried Scotchman than the plaid covering in a sagging Morris chair. And at the reception desk, there was no Wesley McDuff registered or ever heard of. I'm sorry, sir. So at that, I was ready to call it quits. I turned for the door, but before I got there, I was stopped. The uniform said bellhop, and the sprinkle of freckles plus barn cowlick said all-American boy. But the shifty eyes and the narrow mouth that slid over to the side of his face when he talked said something else. Like racetrack talk. Say, uh, pardon me, sir, but uh, I happen to overhear you ask after a Scotchman. Uh, Wesley McDuff, was it? Yeah, you know where he is? Well, uh, yes, and, uh... Yes, and, uh, how much? Ten? Five. Okay, sport, five. Mm. But let's get out of the traffic, huh? Over here, under this map. Like I was pointing out something to you. That's a fresh idea, yeah. Thanks. Uh, the fiver? Oh, here. Now, uh, where's McDuff? On his way to Burbank, dead drunk. You're crazy. I talked to him less than half an hour ago. He was stone sober and a long way from the party mood. Mm, could be. But 15 minutes ago, I helped Lord Ashley Duke piling into a cab. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Ashley Duke, how does he fit? Uh, he found this McDuff in the alley outside. Oh. I was just coming back from dinner when I saw him pick the guy up. He couldn't say a word. Huh? But a Blue Shield medical card we found in his wallet read Wesley McDuff, 13 Vineland Avenue, Burbank. Boy, he was out colder than my old yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen, call. Junior, here's another five. Tell me in fast, who's Lord Ashley Duke? A nightclub character. Entertainer. Lives here with his wife, uh, Lady Ashley Duke, when they're in L.A. Well, this, um, is he legitimate, this law business? Nah, nah, but he plays it to the hilt. Why, after we piled that Macduff into the cab, he dusted his white gloves off, genteel-like, <laughs> slipped the monocle he wears into his eye, and grabbed another cab and shoved. Mm. He's a phony. His real name is Bert Dukes, and the lady is Gert. And on her, it shows. What do you mean, shows? That the second she gets behind her door, uh, they got suite 312. She climbs out of her accent like it was a tight girdle. Uh. Especially when she and that niece of hers go at it. Uh, uh, yes, sir, the famous Merrimack cabins are on Route 66 near St. Louis. Oh, good evening, Mr. Fisher. Good evening, Tom. Okay, where were we? The niece, the niece. Oh, yeah, quite a doll. Her name's Merle Brimmer. Acts as a business manager, so she must also have brains. Now tell me, who's Cornelius? Cornelius? Yeah. <laughs> What's breaking you up? Who is he? Nobody but the star of the act. The Lord and Lady do a farce thing, uh, a takeoff on English drawing room stuff, and Cornelius plays the butler. Plays it in a derby and a boiled shirt, no less. Well, why the giggles? You've seen a derby and boiled shirt before? Yeah, yeah, sure I have. But on Cornelius, it looks different. You see, mister, he's a chimpanzee. <laughs> There, Cornelius definitely added screwball. 
But I also knew that prospective client Macduff had been sapped and piled into a cab for good riddance, which could add to less than funny. So I decided I'd look around a little longer, especially in the vicinity of Milady's chamber, number 312. When I stepped out of the elevator on the third floor, an owl-faced waiter was just piloting a dinner cart loaded down with dirty dishes out of the room. And when the car joggled out of the corridor rug, it nearly upset a coffee pot, which left the waiter's mind on the juxtaposition of cot and pot and not the door. But if he'd left open inches, I waited till he passed me. Then I moved up to where I could both see and hear Lady Ashley Duke and her niece Merle exploding at each other through an after-dinner conversation. The former was built like an upended blimp with as much charm as a mooring mast. The latter was blonde and female, spy beautiful. And also, she was nonchalantly slipping a shiny 32 automatic from desk drawer to purse. Oh, now, wait a minute, Gert. Before you snap a say, you listen to me. Why? So you can explain once more how a poor Uncle Bird's idiotic mistakes are just bad luck. Ten thousand bucks worth of bad luck. Nuts. Bird don't know anything about investments. He shouldn't be allowed to touch a red cent. And my pretty, from here on out, that's exactly the way it's going to be. Believe me. Oh, cut it, Gert, and quit blaming Uncle Bert and me. Are you kidding? Why shouldn't I blame the two of you? He's a jerk, and you... I never wanted you with us in the first place, my niece. <laughs> oh, shut up. And remember, dear Aunt, your husband likes me around. I'm good for his morale, he says. He'll never let you fire me. So don't waste your breath. Auntie, get out of here. Go on, get down to the freight house and keep your eyes open. We don't want to lose Cornelius. Don't worry, darling. Guard duty's an old specialty of mine. Yes, who is it? Name's Marlowe. We'd like to see Lord Ashley Duke. Oh, well, I... Oh. Well. Uh, yes. <laughs> He's not in, but... What did you want to see him about? Oh, uh, business. Uh, can you help me? Perhaps. You see, I'm his business... She used to be his business manager. She was just leaving, weren't you, Merle, darling? Yes, Merle, darling, was. Mr. Marlowe, Lady Ashley Duke. Goodbye, Auntie. Unhappy, huh? Oh, rather. Uh, Now, sir, to save each other's time, let me be blunt. Lord Ashley Duke is no longer interested in making any investments whatsoever, nor will he be interested at a future date. Is that clear, sir? Yes, like well water, Lady Ashley Duke. And if I were looking for an investor, I'd keep it in mind. But you see, I'm a private detective working for Wesley Macduff. A paper? A lousy paper pushing his way Uh, in here. Why are you... Easy, easy, Gertie. Let go. Get your filthy hands off me. Sure. Just as soon as you get back into neutral. I also want to save us time, and I want to save Cornelius, too. How do we talk or wrestle, which? Oh, all right. Seven weeks ago, Lord Ashley Duke and I bought Cornelius from that crazy monkey razor out in Burbank. We paid Macduff $30,000 for a run-down 17-year-old chimpanzee. Well, then why do you want to kill him? Macduff thinks you're going to. Yeah, Macduff's crazy. Just because we change our minds and instead of staying here in L.A., decide to go on the road. Macduff thinks Cornelius will catch cold and die. So he wants him back. Yeah, but you'll get your money back. Yeah, and what about the seven weeks of work just to teach him to drop a glass? Not only that, he's a wonderful imitator. I can see your point. Besides, a deal's a deal. And we're taking the risk of Cornelius' death, not the loon who runs that Burbank animal farm. Why, that Scotchman thinks every animal in the joint's related to him. <laughs> it's an old idea, honey. But look, Lady Ash... Ash what? We've had our talk, people. Now get out. Go on. Go on, get out before I forget I'm, uh, a lady. Over here, Tompkins. What is it? A telephone call, sir. Booth four this way, please. Make out all right up there? Jim Dandy. Good. Now, uh, if you feel I was underpaid... I feel we came out even, Buster. Besides, I'm running low on farthings. Unless, sir... Yes? You know where the freight house Cornelius calls home is located. Uh Uh-uh. Blank. Okay. So long, Tompkins. Hello. Tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You all right, Macduff? Hey, it takes more than a foul blow in the dark to stop me, man. And it's just what Lord Ashley Duke is going to discover in many minutes. What do you mean? That I've run out of patience. I ain't going to act, not talk. 
I'm about to take Cornelius back with my own hands, and I want you to help oh, me. Oh, now, wait a minute. Now, look, man, I'm in a drugstore at Pershing Square, close by the freight house where Cornelius is caged for shipment. I want you but to meet me. But you can't steal him, McDuff. Ah, I, I can. Steal him and disguise the animal so they'll ne'er be able to claim him again. So they won't be able to kill him. Oh, McDuff, I can't go along with that. Then I chose the wrong man. Oh. There's precious little time left, Mr. Marlowe. Tomorrow they leave Los Angeles. Now, will you help me? No. Beside McDuff, you'll never get away with it. There's a girl, Ashley Duke's niece, who's got a gun, and I... McDuff. McDuff! All the way from the phone booth through the lobby into my car outside, I kept telling myself three things. One, I wasn't working for McDuff. Two, McDuff was about to commit a crime. And three, I couldn't worry about the gun in Merle Brimmer's purse. It was all none of my business. Oh, when I was in behind the wheel of my car, I pointed it toward my apartment on Franklin, lit a cigarette, and forgot about the whole thing. But a block later, I threw the cigarette out, turned, and headed for Pushing Square. Scots with animal farms in Burbank obviously weren't the only crazy people in Los Angeles. After arriving in Pushing Square, I was 30 minutes piling up wisecracks, frozen stairs, and assorted giggles before I hit pay dirt. A bottle boy with a great memory. Yeah, sure, I know the place. Only spot around will ship live animals or <clears throat> the rest of the stuff that they handle. Anything from an eel to an elephant. How about pink ones? I got those, too. That's what I thought. Yeah, I worked there once during, <clears throat> during the Christmas rush. Made the price of a fifth in one day. Now, I... look, look, you'll do it again right now if you can tell me one thing. The address, what is it? It's, uh, yeah. 44... Come on, come on. 42... Stick with it. Uh, yeah. 4th Street. Yeah, <laughs> boy. <laughs> Here's five. Crawl back in the bottle. I'll see you. The neighborhood was half residential, half industrial, and all run down including the freight house, which was two windowless stories of dirty red brick hovering over a loading ramp on a deserted, shadowy street. I started slowly toward it when suddenly a side door flew open and an excited old man with flashlight and giant key ring that spelled Night Watchman leaped out of the building, arms and legs going like twin beaters on a mix master. Hey, hey, Pop! Hold it, is it the chimp? Yes, and he's raising the roof in there. Yeah? If I shoot him, I... I'll be fired. He's worth a fortune. Yeah, I know all about it. Come on, I'll give you a hand. Oh, okay, good. Well, let's go. Where is he? Upstairs. Hanging in one window at the back. I just turned the lights on and there he was. Oh. When he seen me, he grabbed a stick from the floor and started beating things with oh, it. Oh, fine. And then he broke the window and began to swing on the block and tackle. It runs outside from the roof to the ground. Look, there he is. Yeah, still beating. Hey, stop. Bobby's going to play it. There he goes. Down the roof. And away. Well... All right, Pop, we better call the Look, cops. Over there, near his empty cage. It's a girl. Blood all over her head. Holy smoke. Merle Brimmer. She did? Yeah. Beat to death with a stick the chimp just threw at us. Then, then you think the monkey did it? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. He's a great imitator, Pop. It could have been somebody else. Not the monkey? Then who? Who else? A monkey's uncle. A Scotchman named Macduff. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Groucho Marx will make another of his famed personal appearances on most of the same CBS stations this Wednesday night. Groucho Marx, whose many activities include emceeing You Bet Your Life, one of the craziest quiz shows on the air. You're cordially invited to hear Groucho Marx every Wednesday on CBS. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Monkey's Uncle. around the body of the girl on the freight house floor. I took a close look at the cage lock. There was no doubt that it had been forced from the outside. The watchman staring down at the body was shaking like a motorcycle with square wheels. 
I took him by the arm and walked him down the stairs and outside for some air. It's, it's terrible. I don't know what to do. Nothing like this ever happened here before, and the boss never told me what I'm supposed to do in a case like this. Well, it's I... easy. Just call the police. The police? Yeah. Also the SBCA and Frank Buck. Chances are we'll need them all before the night's over. Okay, mister. Thanks, I should... Hey, who's that getting out of that cab? From the top hat cape and spats, I'd say it was one lord, Ashley Duke, the legal owner of the chimp. Oh, what are you two blighters staring at? Out of my way. Uh, just a moment, just a moment, before you go inside. I want to talk to you, Lord Ashley Duke. Hmm? You know my name, do you? Well, now, my job, that's interesting. I don't know you, sir. I'll survive. Why'd you come down here tonight? Because I heard that my niece was here, protecting my property. And that's no suitable task for a girl. Not capable to do that sort of thing, you know. It's a man's job, you know. Had a beastly time finding the place, too. You haven't been here before, huh? Oh, yes, yes. A couple of days ago. But that, that, that was in broad daylight. Uh, stand aside. One sir. thing more. Hmm? Why did you slug Wesley McDuff tonight and dump him in a cab? Just who are you, anyway? Private detective Philip Marlowe's the name. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds British enough. Hmm. About as British as you are. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yeah. And you, I presume, are the watchman. Yes, uh, sir. That's me, Your Highness. What about Macduff, Your Highness? There's no choice. The blighter wanted to welch on the transaction we've made. I refused, and he threatened me. So, I bopped him. And then, <laughs> made out he was intoxicated, you know. Packed him off in a cabin. Oh, oh, oh. Nevertheless, when a man sells me a monkey, by George, that monkey is mine. And thought that treatment might bring Macduff to his bloody senses. Well, it didn't. It made him tougher. And what's more, the chimpanzee is gone. And Cornelius is gone. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come on, Pop. Uh, okay. way she was when we found her. And that crazy monkey was in here just jumping up and down like he was throwing a fit. It was McTuff. McTuff, that's who it was. That madman. Hey, Michael, what was that? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. You stay here. The scream had come from the architectural blunder next door. It was one of those big gingerbread houses left over from the 1800s, and I got there just in time to meet the witch. The scaly front portal was jerked open in front of me, and there she stood. Like a pool cue in high panic, topped by a head of brittle orange hair, half down up tight in curlers, the other half streaming over her face. She clutched frantically at the stained kimono with one hand and me with the other. Take it easy. Hold it, will you? What's going on? Oh, oh, that face, that old face. What face? Let me see, I even see. Oh, protect me. It's a fear. Oh, take it easy. Will you calm down and tell me what happened? I was upstairs in my room taking my yeah. hair down. When I happened to look over at the window, and there was that face shoved right up against the glass. Oh, I swear I never seen nothing like that thing before. I took the cure, mister. All right, now listen, I... hair all over it. Red eyes and big grinning mouth. What was like one of them giant gorillas that got me a movie. That's Cornelius, all right. Where's the room? I'm up there at the head of them stairs. Oh. Hey, you ain't going up there and leave me all alone, I... Well, then come along. Corny's a trained chimp. He won't hurt you. Oh, no, not me, brother. I didn't... <laughs> Where? Where? Right there. He stuck out his tongue and made a face at me. Tell me, is that a passage out there between the houses? Oh, no. No, it's a kind of an air shaft. Only a closed up at the back. Oh, you mean he can't get through to the alley? Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's no way out of there except the street. All right, come on. Let's get outside. We got him cornered. Oh, you got him cornered, baby, mister. Not me. I don't want nothing more to do with that ugly puss. The air shaft was a scant 18 inches wide as dark and cluttered as the inside of a goat pen with odors to match. I worked my way back as far as the bashful light from the street reached. Oh, be careful in there, mister. And I stopped and listened. But Cornelius was a genius. There wasn't a sound. And I couldn't see my hand in front of my face to say nothing of a black-haired chimpanzee who was no doubt getting a big kick out of the entire procedure. I decided to try psychology on it. So I called in what I hoped was a firm but friendly voice and it got me no place. I groped my way along the wall of the drain pipe and called again. This time shorter on the friendly and longer on the firm, which was a mistake. The drain pipe should have given me a hint, but it didn't. Oh, what? What's the matter? He's gone. Oh, who? Who's gone? That gorilla. 
Oh. It was up on the drain pipe. <clears throat> it hit you on the head with something that <clears throat> ran right past me and oh. got away in a taxi. Oh, come on, let's get out oh, of here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, baby. I I could have sworn you said the, the monkey took a taxi. Yeah, you did. I watched the whole oh, thing. My. As soon as it got out in the street, a man in a checkered <clears throat> can with a crooked stick in his hand came out from between them buildings over there and called it. Uh. They ran up to a taxi. The driver jumped out and they drove away. I see him. The driver jumped out and they drove away. Yeah. I don't think you took the cure soon enough. Well, I seen something else, too. Huh? A fat boy in a high hat and spats came charging out of the freight house yeah. there, saw the cab leaving, got in a green coat that green was parked in front and took off. Holy smoke, that's my car. Yeah, oh, it's gone. How do you like that? Yeah. Now maybe you believe me, huh? Every screwy word, sweetheart. Now, look, you didn't happen no. to see... That's the cab driver there. Did anybody see what happened? I gotta have a witness. My taxi was hijacked off of me by two crazy guys. One of them looked like an ape, exactly like an ape. Move over, bud. We're on the same raft. My car's gone too. Tell me what happened. Will you start at the top? Okay. Tonight I bring this big shot in a high hat down here to the freight house. He hops out, tells me to wait. See? Yeah. So I drive down the block and turn around. I I'm parked right over there, trying to grab a quick forty winks. When up comes this lunar Scotchman. Yeah, that's him. Yeah. He throws me a fast address and starts getting in, see? I politely tell him the flag is down, but he keeps coming. You see, it's just yeah, like Yeah, yeah, I, I know it's just like it. Now, look, did you ever see this Scotchman before? No, never. I figure maybe he's got a snoot full of happy days, nothing more. Uh-huh. So I'm reaching over to block him when a pair of hands that feels like a doormat with muscles mm. grabs me around the neck. I twist around and look. And what do I see? Cornelius. Him I don't know, but an ape man is crawling in my wind. So help me, I'm rubbing noses with a missing link. Yeah, I know. Then what happened? Mac, I jump out of the taxi, and before I know it, the old geezer gives me a claw with his stick, piles in, the next thing my taxi's gone just like that. You gotta believe me, somebody's gotta back me up. <laughs> if I try this on the cops, they'll have me in a padded cell in no time. Well, don't worry about it, fella. Just reach hard for that address the Scotchman gave you. Can you remember it? Oh, sure. Uh, let me see, it was the... Uh, the uh, the Rushmore. Rushmore. Yeah. yeah they, that's a, a down at the Hills Motel out on Vernon. Yeah. Somewhere around uh, Beverly Boulevard. Ed Nathan. Oh, stepped on something here on the sidewalk. Oh, you sure did, Judy. Smashed it, too. It looks like somebody's watch crystal. Sure, a lady's watch crystal. Oh, nice one. See, it had this hunk of black ribbon with it. Ladies weren't. Hey, wait a minute. Let me see that. Sure, here. The velvet. See? Yeah, yeah, it sure is. That doesn't fit. Not here. No one's been here but the three of us and the chimp. So long, kids. Hey, hey, wait. Where are you I'm going to talk to a liar about a murder. I'll see you later at headquarters, I hope. But what about my time? Talk to the night watchman in the freight house. You'll be good for each other. I was two blocks on foot finding another taxi in 15 minutes getting from there out to the motel, worrying all the way because I'd left my gun under the front seat of my car. Business was slow at the Rushmore. The only cabin that showed a light was the last in the rear next to the alley. I was sure of what I'd find inside. In spite of the fact that neither the stolen cab nor my coupe was any place in sight. When I heard the voices, I decided to bluff it. I went up to the front door and pressed my ear against the flimsy panel. Anyway, a bargain's a bargain, but tough. You'd have done better to stick by it. They'd have stuck by it if ye had your scurvy crook. Ah, don't reach for your chain. It's a little late for that. You're in a real jam now. I'm going to see you blamed for my niece's murder. But I did not kill her. I pushed her down. I. Yeah. She caught me unlucky in Cornelia's cage and tried to stop me. But I did not kill her. You did that. Yes, yes, but who knows that? Except you and the monk there. And he can't talk. And you won't believe me. Ah, you daft man. Why did you do it? Because I had to. Because Merle was bleeding me to death. Every cent I could lay my hands on. I had to buy her silence. I had to pretend to lose thousands in poor investments. Well... Merle got what was coming to her, and you gave me that chance. I found her on the floor where you left her and simply finished the job. Then you ran off and came back in that taxi 15 minutes later, the very spirit of innocence. I saw you. Very well, Lord Ashley Duke. You've got me as a thief, too, so get on with it. Get on with it, filthy evil plan. I'm ready. Don't be in a hurry, McDuff. Stay where you are, Ashley. Don't bother turning around. Just drop the gun. Oh, I knew you'd not let me down, laddie. I knew it. What's this, old boy? It's rather an untimely hit. Skip the accent, Bert. You won't need it where you're going. Drop that gun, I said. Before you move, shoot me with that pipe in your pocket. Marlowe, I've got your gun. You're in my hand, and you know it. Want to bet? Well, with the light out... 
on your skull. Do you can this condition? Never mind, skip it. I don't want to talk about it. So, where's Ashley? Trust up there in the corner. He should be coming around soon. You see, Cornelius, as you've no doubt learned, is a great imitator. When he saw Ashley bat you on the head with a gun, yeah. he grabbed McCain, leaped up on the dresser there, and batted Ashley on the head. Oh, no. Not with this headache. Hey. Don't tell me I'm indebted to that. Just when I was learning to hate him. Aye, we both are for our lives. Mm. But tell me, what does a black velvet ribbon and a, a watch crystal mean? He mumbled that over and over while we, uh, you were out. Oh. Well, that's how I knew Ashley was a liar and a killer. See, the cab driver stepped on a round piece of glass that looked like a watch crystal with a ribbon attached. Uh-huh. Happened on the sidewalk in front of an air shaft. Actually, the... Oh, actually, the glass was a monocle. Dropped by Lord Ashley Duke. No. Ashley'd never been at that spot. No. But if Cornelius had, and if Cornelius dropped the monocle, it indicated that Lord Ashley Duke had been someplace with Cornelius early at night, you see? Ah. That could only be the freight house. Yet Ashley claimed he hadn't been there for two days. Oh, I see. Oh, you do. Oh, my head. How about you, Cornelius? <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the best answers I've had tonight. take long at police headquarters. Maybe an hour altogether. A killer was locked up for trial and the key witness ate three erasers, spilled a quart of ink, and broke a window before the homicide boys finally gave up. I watched the phony lord, Ashley Duke, walk down the corridor to his cell. Any connection he had with man was just the category. And I watched McDuff and company leave, too. A couple of regular guys. A monkey... The monkey's uncle. A genuine old Scott who loved life. And his shuffling friend whose only limitation was his inability to speak. But he communicated all right. In the only language that means anything. Love of one creature for another. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. As a special note of interest, Philip Marlowe fans, you'll be glad to know that radio and television Life magazine has this week named Gerald Moore as the best male actor in radio. Featured in our cast were Mary Lansing, John Daner, Tudor Owen, Sam Edwards, Michael Ann Barrett, Harry Bartell, and Junius Matthews. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a case-hardened car hop knocked me down a flight of stairs. An honest woman was strangled by a green silk sash. And a simpering dandy was shot to death. All because of a run-of-the-mill traffic accident 500 miles away. them all on CBS, and one of the funniest parts of that all comes from the bird brain of a woman, Miss Gracie Allen of Burns and Allen. Top troopers on the American stage for years, top radio stars after that, George and Gracie are now playing a big part in CBS's great Wednesday night lineup. Bing Crosby, Groucho Marx, George and Gracie, Dr. Christian. Join George Burns and Gracie Allen this Wednesday night on most of the same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations.
This is CBS, where Burns and Allen are heard every Wednesday night at the Columbia Broadcasting System.